Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. We've got a, we've got a, uh, another guest on here who I, I think I'm hoping is going to bring a really twisted perspective to this, but I could be wrong. <laughs> So Danilo, no, 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 it's cool. So Danilo, uh, who just joined in, let me give, let me give like a, I'm going to try to do like a fast, rapid intro of all the people that are here and then I'll say who you are. So below me is Neil Karkanis, who is a student at South Jersey Sudbury School, who uh, actually that's kind of close to you. And he and I kind of organized this, this net neutrality thing because we care about this issue and we're passionate trying to raise awareness and figure out what to do about it. Uh, to my side over on this side is Adam Zhang that I went to college with, and he also is a YouTube content creator and far more political savvy than I am about these issues. And so it's nice to have him here. Nick on this side is uh, an activist in the cannabis world for reducing the stigma surrounding uh, I, cannabis. I can't, I can't see where they're where they're in relation to you. Is, is it the guy with the guy with the drapes in the background? You, you're talking about. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. So Nick, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. And, uh, and Nick runs a, <laughs> get, get an online an online store selling uh, apparel related to this cannabis stigma removal movement. And then Nick, Ooh. Neil, the other Nick, who's down there with the baby. That's the only one in the, okay. in the screen with the baby. Nick's an organizer right. in San Diego who has built a local uh, community revolving around uh, mindfulness and Buddhism practitioner. He started the Wake Up House. And also is involved in um, Represent Us, which is the San Diego chapter of a national movement to take money out of politics. Now, Danilo comes in, who, uh, as I know Danilo, he's a parent of an unschooler, right? Is, is sort of how we connected uh, in some way. Or you're involved yeah. in unschooling and you've done stand-up comedy. And that's how we first connected, was when I was trying to find comedians that were involved in unschooling to do a tour. And then I found out Danilo runs a YouTube show a channel and a podcast called Peaceful Anarchism. So what is interesting to me is the idea of here we are sitting here frustrated about this law that's being repealed, saying that net neutrality is going to be taken away. We're all stressed and we're anxious and we're upset about it. And there's a piece of me that like is very anarchistic. I don't like the idea of rules. I don't like the idea of structure. I don't like the idea of being forced to do good things. Yet I'm sitting here and I'm saying, Jesus, it'd be really nice if we had fucking net neutrality laws to prevent corporations from doing shitty things. So I'm very curious to see what the peaceful anarchist thinks <laughs> about net neutrality. Ooh, wow. <laughs> well, uh, good evening, gentlemen. It's great to be here. Um, I was just listening for the past 15 minutes. And, and it seems uh, I'm uh, I'm alone. No, no, <laughs> right? no. I want the alternative perspective. I, just, no, I, I, I want, want to give it. as much as much want, background as I can. I want you to persuade me, dude. I want to be. Wait, wait, wait. No, it's okay. It's okay. No, I, I just want to say that um, what what I say. Um, it's hard to understand if I don't describe like what anarchism is, what like where I come from. Like if I just say I I oppose that neutrality, it's like you know that brings up all kind of barriers, emotional responses. But um, like for me, okay. Really quick, I can just get cover the basics of, of why I am an anarchist, or also called a voluntarist. Um, so, anarchist is basically someone who believes um, that no ruler is legitimate, right? There should be no ruling class, or i.e., no state, right? And then a voluntarist is uh, somebody who supports voluntarism or voluntary interactions between consenting individuals, right? And the the, the utmost uh, representation. Of of uh, coercion or or the threat of violence is the state, right? Because nothing that the state does is voluntary. We must pay our taxes. We must obey the law. There is no question <laughs> when a police officer is behind you, he's not asking you to pull over. He's requiring you to pull over. So everything about the state is coercion, is a threat of violence, is basically a gun. Another way to say a law is an opinion with a gun, right? And, and so again, so so t there's a there's a common uh, voluntarist 
maxim, which is taxation is theft, right? Because if it was voluntary, they wouldn't be demanded at the point of a gun, right? So given that <laughs> backdrop of why I'm an anarchist, basic rundown. <laughs> um, so net neutrality um, is an interesting topic. Um, now, I, I understand what you guys are saying. I, I think I understand what you guys are saying in that, you know, uh, the internet is... Um, it's a wonderful resource. We can access all this information. And, you know, I have my content creation and you, as some of you guys as well. And we, a lot of people do their activism through the internet and it's really a wonderful thing. Um, and then, and, and so as far as I understand net neutrality is that they want to make it like a utility, right? Like water, like electricity. So in essence, it seems... Next step. Say again? That, that would be a next step, but yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, so in essence, what they want to do, it seems to me, is they want to nationalize these companies and put them under complete state control, right? And oh, oh, actually, you know, another thing I should mention is, um, you know, one of the common fallacies of, of people um, when they interact with anarchists is they think, oh, you're just a, 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 um, an apologist for the big corporation, right? Like you love Monsanto, you love Chase, you love Bank of America. No, of course not. But we also recognize that these large mega corporations, including AT&T, Verizon, and Comcast, all these, all these huge um, um, ISP companies, um, if you look in the history, especially AT&T, which has been around like almost, almost 100 years, AT&T was basically started as a government monopoly, right? So one of the interesting things that, it, that we're all taught in our, in our government schooling, in our government um, history classes, is that if it wasn't for antitrust laws, right, there would be monopolies left and right. People, um, you know, you know, companies would be, you know, conglomerating and getting enormous, and you know, killing off um, competition. You know, de decreasing the price to kill off competition, and then raising them, shafting the consumer, right? And we all suffer, right? But but in reality, what actually ends up the real, the only reason that these these companies are able to achieve such monstrous proportions is because they have the protection, the legal immunity by the state, conferred by the state, right? Uh, it's called sovereign immunity, and then they also um, they also control the politicians. In effect, bribing the politicians, or it's called regulatory capture, right? So, so you know, people clamor. Let's say, let's say the the um, uh, the Occupy Wall Street people, right? You know, whole, you know, the whole crisis happened. Uh, what was it? Was it after? Was it after two thousand eight that they started? I, I think so, right? Around yeah, there? the aftermath of the financial crisis. Okay, okay. So right after that, people, you know, the whole Occupy Wall Street people protesting Wall Street, when in effect, the only reason that these financial institutions are so powerful is because they are so connected and and so protected by the state. So in, in essence, these corporations. Um, would not exist to the to the extent and to the power that they do exist without the legal immunity and legal protection of the state. So basically, all they need, all that needs to happen for these corporations to um, to to break up and to uh, to weaken is basically to subject them to to competition that every single private business that does not have political clout, that cannot buy a, a, a politician, subject them to that competition and they will automatically, <laughs> they will automatically shrink. There is absolutely no way that a corporation can maintain its monstrous proportions. Now, wh now when we're talking about net neutrality, see the, the common fear I think is, you know, if we, if we don't regulate these companies, they will again grow to monstrous proportions and just just you know censor left and right and things like that. But um, so yeah, so so basically, what I'm saying is that if we do regulate, not only will it not work to regulate these companies, it will actually um, be counterproductive, right? Because through the through the method of regulatory capture, they will easily um, either buy and bribe politicians to pass regulations that are beneficial to them or they will they will provide <laughs> their own people to staff um, the agencies that are meant to regulate them right and, and and in effect write the regulation that is supposed to regulate themselves <laughs> and, and so what, what ends up happening okay hold on I'm almost done what ends up happening is that um, not only does it not work and it, and it not um, weaken them or restrain them but it actually 
stifles competition, right? Because these enormous corporations do have the deep pockets to comply with their own regulations. However, the small startup companies, which if they were allowed to compete with these large firms, um, if they were allowed to keep compete in the marketplace, which again, they are prevented through many legal barriers, through many re- regulatory barriers, um, if they were allowed to compete, that alone would weaken and uh, diminish their power and influence. All right, good. Do you have something adding you want to ask them? Well, it seems like we we agree on the the problem at hand, but the what we differ is on this issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, we agree that these corporations have too much influence on the government. Yeah. On the one hand, you know, money buying you power, power buying you more money. But if we remove this regulatory framework, I think that is really where the big issue comes at hand, because these these national monopolies will. Uh, will develop. I guess I'm going to disagree with you there that a monopoly can only exist because of government regulation. Uh, I think it's going to exist with or without that regulation. So we need to at least try to curtail and reduce that power in some way. Um, when you look at the, the monopoly that the telecoms already have today, um, we would be giving them more power if net neutrality were to be abolished. Well, I, I really, really... Um I, I can't see that happening only because if really there was no regulation, like for example, in, um, you know, let's say in, in electronics, like, you know, in cell phones and computers in, in, uh, in laptops, very little regulation, right? And what is the result, right? High efficiency, you know, very fast innovation, you know, monumental innovation and low prices. That, that to me is a direct result of a non non-regulated, virtually free market. We, pretty, we don't really have a 100% free market, but a virtually free market. But what you do have in markets that are immensely regulated and heavily taxed is you have a stifling of innovation and basically it freezes. <laughs> it freezes in time. Innovation is destroyed. I mean, look at, look at public schools, right? 100 years ago, how do they teach kids? Uh, desk, chair, chalkboard. How do they teach kids today? <laughs> Desk, chair, chalkboard. There is absolutely no innovation, no innovation um, when the government takes control or nationalizes anything. Look at the post office. <laughs> post office functions basically right now at like a seventeen billion dollar deficit. Right, they're in debt. <laughs> now, if that was a private company, no private company could stay in business. <laughs> seventeen billion dollars, right? So it, it, they either have to innovate improve their product or go out of business and at which point another company would come in, take its place and improve upon the failures of the previous company. Right? So, well, so, so, okay, so, um, yeah, you go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask. So, um, let's so if you're opposed to net neutrality, right, because it can open the door to all its innovation, how will that improve the situation with telecoms if net neutrality is repealed? Because the, if, in that case, these companies still have power that you're talking about. They'll still have sway over the government. And now they'll have even more control of what we can see. So how can a repeal of net neutrality be beneficial in that situation? Well, well, that's exactly why I'm not just opposed to net neutrality. That's why, that's, that's why I'm an anarchist. <laughs> that's why every single day I talk about what the state is, what a law is, what regulation is, what a tax is. Right? So it's not, just, it's not just that I'm for you know, cannabis legalization or I'm for... Um, you know, opposing net neutrality or whatever, you know, it's that it, it's the underlying institution of the state, right? The state, again, going back to the very definition of what the state is, it's just um, a, a monopoly on violence or a monopoly on coercion. That's it. All they have to, their only arsenal to solve any complex problem is a gun, is a knife, or is jail, prison, okay. prison. So, only way right, that so, they have to solve complex problems. Right, I can understand, but uh, so in an ideal world, we wouldn't need net neutrality because there'd be a free and open market. But given that there's no free and open market for the internet, isn't net neutrality a good, uh, I guess, compromise? Because there's no way we're going to remove all of uh, all the regulation on the internet anytime soon. So given that, given that we have regulation, Given that they have these monopolies, isn't net neutrality the best uh, compromise to move us into somewhat of a a fair system? Well, um, again, I don't. I don't think. Not only it, will it be ineffective uh, net neutrality, but it will be counter, counterproductive if if the companies are not completely nationalized. If they're not completely nationalized, um, then again, they, they will probably 
and and this has happened in history. <laughs> the, the 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 corporations send their own people into the regulatory agencies that are meant to regulate them and have them write their own laws that are meant to regulate themselves. And and the only thing that it does is buffer them and protect them. You know, it's basically what a definition of a monopoly is: is a, is creation of the state, and it it will stifle any kind of innovation, any kind of competition, any new startup that can potentially um, yield a better product at a cheaper price. Is this and it's, well, not so, exactly? Uh, yeah. That's, That's where I would jump in a little bit, just because I think really that is a a supposition that like anti-corruption acts are not actively you know underway. Because, yeah, I mean, ultimately, you're talking about money in politics and people, you know, even, you know, <laughs> the chairman of the FCC right now is a perfect example, right? Yeah. Um, however, if that is to continue, you're right. But the, ho the hope, I guess, is right now that if we can somehow maintain some net neutrality, continue our activism, then we can actually have some really tough campaign finance laws that prevent that type of scenario from occurring. Um, right? So, I mean... Doesn't that make sense though? If like, I, I mean, in an ideal world, for me personally, I don't think that the, the whole dichotomy of having a big government versus a uh, big business to try to regulate business to keep it from becoming monopoly is ever going to be successful. Um, and yeah, in an ideal world, we would love to change that from the very foundation and, and move it to something like you're talking about. But in the meantime, I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. And realistically, we have to do something that works for us that doesn't push us towards a totalitarian state. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like, uh, that, uh, and I would say that the one, oh, I'll just add one more thing. I would say an ideal, I think, compromise is, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of microcapitalism, um, but it's a form of capitalism that basically says instead of having, you know, here, here's the dichotomy we have. We have Republicans on one side that are like, okay, Big business. Let's try to. Or libertarians are also on the same side. Let's have a free and open market, no regulation, and just let business do its thing and innovate as it as it should please. And on the other side, Democrats are terrified <laughs> of what that would mean because it would pollute the environment. There would have tons of like, uh, you know, uh, social justice issues pop up. And you know, you need to have a powerful organization, equally as powerful like the government, to just try to regulate that. So now you have our current situation where you have Democrats versus Republicans. Both of them think they're right, and both of them are both wrong and right. And I would say that both of them are too powerful. The government needs to be smaller, and organizations should be smaller. And there should be a cap on how big organizations should get, and the capital should be in as many hands as possible, instead of sequestering it to the hands of a few. Um, that's the ideal of a micro-capitalist system is some things are nationalized when they get too powerful and the rest of things you try to keep unregulated so that businesses can grow, but not to an extent where they become too powerful that it, it starts to threaten the very system that it exists in. Um, and for me, I would love to push towards that, but I don't think that's realistically going to happen in my lifetime. Um, I think that the best we have at this point is to try to work within the current system and try to minimize the damage of <laughs> the, the system that we're currently in. And I think ultimately, if you put the, the internet, which is one of the most powerful tools that we have in the hands of the very people who are basically doing the impressing, you have recipe for disaster. You have a recipe for totalitarianism. And you have something where the internet can then be censored by business and the government because they're essentially the same thing at this point. And I don't think that that's safe. <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking about the safety of my child. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the safety of all of us. I don't, I don't think it's a very safe situation to just turn the keys over to the very people <laughs> who are potentially threatening the existence of our, of our entire civilization. I am... Um... I think that the, uh, the 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 biggest problem that I would uh, I would see having with the uh, argument about oh the uh, net neutrality helps um, uh, these monopolies uh, and this is a question is some um, why aren't we seeing these um these uh, strict competitions um, with uh, before we had uh, net neutrality we still had roughly the same options for ISPs before net neutrality was implemented and 
I don't know, was it 2014 or 2015? I think it was 2014, I'm not sure. But uh, we still saw these same companies. They're still practically monopoly. And uh, it's because of, uh, I think Jim can someone, probably- Someone got like something clicking in the background? Yeah, someone's got a clicking noise in the background. Oh, uh, sorry, that's my son. He's playing in the playground. Uh, <laughs> someone was riding a board. It sounded like a cash register, like- Yeah, it sounded like a typewriter. Um, but anyways, so um, uh, where was I? Uh, I was talking about- um, how we still see these yeah right. so and uh how uh and also how why would these uh companies be campaigning uh for the um obviously you could see how uh the end of net neutrality could benefit them uh from a um a point of view uh the end of net neutrality could sorry i've lost my train of thought there um i'm trying to remember what i was saying before that um uh, I thought I was talking about um, yeah, the, the status quo is that the you know they had a lot of power and they you know why right. are they so the thing is it, it really hasn't changed and I don't see in act in fact I see at the end of the neutrality uh, improving these monopolies power because the ISPs could potentially restrict uh, access to a website of another ISP uh, that's a startup ISP and uh, I, I really don't and especially, I have to agree with uh, what uh, Nick was saying about how uh, wholeheartedly about how um, while uh, I think what you're saying is it has some idealistic uh, benefits, what we can do within the current system right now is limited, and, and net neutrality uh, really stops these. Uh, let's be honest, sir. Let's call it what it is. It's a monopoly. They divvy up territory within them. They divvy up territory. They don't compete because they work together, and this has happened. Before net neutrality, it will happen after net neutrality, after the 14th, if it gets repealed. This, uh, I, I really don't see this change. And I didn't, and I didn't, and I don't think anyone saw a bunch of third party companies suddenly crash down after net neutrality was implemented. I think things virtually stayed the same within the monopoly point of view. Okay, right, should I respond? To that? Can I respond? Yeah. <laughs> all right, go for it. Um, all right, so, yeah, so I want to respond to, um, so there's two Neils, right? Neil, the kid, and then Neil with the baby, right? No, there's Nick, Not there's two Nicks. There's Neil is the young one, Nick has a kid, and then there's also Nick without a kid. Okay, okay, so Nick with the kid. <laughs> um, um, what was he talking about? Um, all right, so, so, so one thing I want to say is that um, the state is, uh, the way I describe or I think of the state is like a 900-pound gorilla, right? And... And we, we like point the gorilla and encourage it, maybe with cattle prongs, say, go this way, right? And then once the gorilla starts moving, that's all we can do. <laughs> that's it. We have no more influence anymore. We can maybe influence a one direction, but that's it, right? The state, again, is a monopoly, right? We, we do vote. You know, we, we can, well, actually, we vote for our, our, you know, the representatives, the politicians. But after that, so much of what happens in the state is... Um, not decided by the citizenry, right? So this is why, to me, another another reason why it's so dangerous to entrust the state to do anything, because we essentially do not control what the state does at all. You know, um, essentially, what controls and and really decides what what politicians do are again the um, the huge corporations that have their corporate lobbyists that go in and bribe these politicians to do whatever they want, right? So this is this is the first thing. Exactly. Um, the second thing is that um, there's there's this also um, there's this idea that the state is um, you know has benevolent um, and angelic people running the state, <laughs> right? That that if only we enact the right legislation the right regulation, um, things will work out, right? Um, when in fact, the state, again, is an institution of coercion and is an institution of power. Now, historically, what kind of person is attracted to an institution of power? Is it, is it the most benevolent? Is it the kind-hearted? Is it the compassionate among us? Is that the person that likes to rule over their fellow man with violence and force? No. In my understanding of history, the type of person that's attracted to positions of power are the most sociopathic and the most megalomaniacal <laughs> and, and those completely lacking in compassion, right? That, that is mostly 
the type of person who is attracted to a position of power. So, um, <laughs> again, entrusting that type of person with any kind of power or any kind of legislation, to me, is very, very dangerous. Okay? Um, and then what, what um, the kid, uh, Nick? The kid, right? Nick? I know. Okay. Neil, sorry. Um, what, what Neil was saying um, about why, why there wasn't competition before net neutrality, um, again, there were very few corporations. And again, they were all monstrously huge and they all had their own little monopolies where they, um, you know, where, where they were functioning, right? Their own little, little areas of influence. So again, there was there's massive amount of regulation already with these with these um, cable companies, with these phone companies, these ISPs, and so again, there is no free market, right? There, there's massive regulatory barriers to any small startup, right? So it's not it's not a free market. It's very far from a free market, and so there's a, a long line of, of monopolies, monopolistic institutions um, that have that have um, occupied this this um you know this field of of internet service providers and before that phone service providers at at t being the the most monstrous so um i just want oh. to uh, really quick uh jim we've had somebody in the comments and i know we were talking about this earlier saying that if someone in the comments really wants to join we can actually have them join and yeah why is and, there someone in there yeah laugh law productions actually asked if he can join the stream so, oh, I think that's uh, Veronica. Oh, great. Well, yeah, let me, yeah, I'll, I'll, so let me, let me pipe in. So, Dinala, I, I, I very much appreciate your persuasion because, like, my fantasy land of the world is one where <laughs> aliens, aliens would show up to Earth. <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen to me. I'm, I'm being really, really okay. practical. So, like, I look at it that okay. I, I dream of a day when aliens will show up here and they will observe okay. us and they won't know whether they're observing socialism or anarchy. And that they'll see like all these people that are being cooperative and collaborative and sharing and peaceful and nobody's telling anybody that they have to do it. So I like live in this world where like I want this like peaceful and cooperative thing where everything works together. But I hate the idea of people being fucking forced to do good and laws are like things that are like forcing people to do good. And so like I look at it like, OK, ultimately, what is the long term way that you end up with that? Is it that like what? You know. What are the structures or like, what, what does it actually look like in practice? And maybe it's a world where there is a government doing like administrative work that's on behalf of the people. Like maybe if things were tipped upside down and like the government actually was working for the people, then that'd be different. Is that realistic or practical? Like, I, I'm not really sure, but it, I mean, it sounds like we're like kind of coming at it from these two views that we both see this thing. They're, they're like these opposite philosophies or opposite structures where we want the same thing in the end. And we're trying to figure out, will people do this if they're not forced to, all right? And then in the middle of all that, like long-term utopian, like dream of like this social anarchy kind of blend, we have in nine days, people are voting as to whether they can uh, adjust the internet in a way to slow down speeds and connections that could potentially silence voices that could, it could be silencing a movement towards anarchism it could be silencing a movement towards socialism and like that's yeah. like this practical thing that has to happen in nine days with this vote so like i, I kind of live in in this <laughs> world of not knowing like how to act like do i devote my energy to um you know like how, where, where does one like put their energy in their in their their kind of fight in this so like i i, I definitely appreciate the the perspective that you have on this and I, I'm, I'm glad i'm glad that you're here giving that and i would like I'd like to add just one more thing just because I'm going to be losing a battery here in a second, so I'll probably have to log off. Um, but I just wanted to say that, uh, and, and just response real quick, the the idea that I think there was a lot of suppositions that were made in, in, the, in, your, in your statement, Dylan, and it's, and I, for the most part, I understand what you're saying, that, the, you know, power-hungry people seek out power. That is without question. I think that you can't really argue against that. But I would say that it's not necessarily power that a lot of people enter politics that are after when they're getting involved in politics. For example, myself, I don't consider myself to be a power hungry person. I'm definitely very cause motivated. And I know that there's a lot of other people out there like me who are getting involved in politics right now because they're really frustrated the way things are and they want things to be better. So to kind of suppose that the entire system is, is you know, corrupted to the core, where people are so power hungry that it will never work, I think is a little bit of an overstatement, um, an oversimplification of the current system. 
Um, and I think that there is a way that at least in the meantime, before again, like we get to what Jim's talking about, maybe some sort of utopian type of a future, which I would hope would be right around the corner. That would be amazing. Are you kidding me? I would love that. But currently we have the current system and I think we have to be responsible in the current system, currently making wise decisions while we have the system we have. And I would say in the long run, in like the not too long run, like the short term, like the next five or 10 years, I think the most single important issue is campaign finance reform and, and getting it so that, you know, politicians can't essentially be bought. I mean, I really suggest you check out the Represent Us national website and just check into the Anti-Corruption Act a little bit so you can kind of get an idea of what the legislation is going to be covering. Um, and it is going to happen. I have no doubt that this Anti-Corruption Act is going to eventually pass. It's just going to take some time and some patience. And in the meantime, we need the internet to stay free and open. Um, and we really need it because if this doesn't stay free and open, that might be the only thing that can possibly jeopardize the movement that is to try to slow the totalitarian, to the progress towards oligarchic form of totalitarianism, which is exactly where we're headed right now. And it's terrifying. I mean, you, we all know what totalitarian states can do. Um, it's just, it's really, really terrifying to think that that would be the possible scenario that we're headed towards. But it definitely seems like that's the writing that's on the wall. And, you know, me and you could like agree or disagree towards like what type of utopian society might be really great. Um, but in the meantime, we need to make, like Jim was saying, some really practical decisions on net neutrality. So that way we have a platform that we can stand on. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but anyway, I got like 7% left and I think I'll probably drop out before I respond again. So it was a pleasure to be with all you guys and I'm um, thank you for inviting me to be on here. I'll watch as long as I have power and then I'll, when I drop out, just know that my heart goes with all of you. <laughs> all right. So now we have <laughs> Thanks, we, we have um we have a new guest here. So uh please go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm Veronica. Uh I work for Jim. Um I I think net neutrality is a good thing because I, I just don't understand why would anyone want to uh, slow somebody else's site down. That just makes no sense to me. Um, well, I mean, come on. If you wanted to, uh, like if I am an internet service provider and I also own a media company, so let's say I own your internet connection and I own a newspaper, and I want you to go to my newspaper's website and read my news and not the other guy's, then I would slow down their websites and not my website. But that's cheating. You're fucking right, it's cheating. That's what it's all about. I mean, <laughs> yeah, damn right. Uh, but actually, <laughs> yeah, you have to do it fair and square. In response, actually, to um, I'm sorry, Danilo, is that how I say it? Yeah, thank you. Good. So, that's good. Uh, Danilo, uh, I I uh, I appreciate the uh, the response to uh, my comments, but uh, I guess I still don't really see how net neutrality would help prevent against. Because basically my stance is, is um, with these monopolies in place, there's really uh, revoking net neutrality will really do nothing but just give these monopolies more power. Because most people say, subject it to the free market. But the problem is there is no free market to subject, uh, there's no said free market to subject uh, this to uh, because of the fact that they have a monopoly. I was talking earlier on this stream about how these ISPs, uh, they have basically, I, I said this uh, many times earlier, so, um, all right, so how many ISPs you know do normally people have in your area? The answer for most is one, maybe two, uh, and those ISPs most likely are these huge companies that all are in favor of gutting net neutrality rules and are all for Pi's plan. Um, uh, and I, I, I just, I, I still, I guess, I still don't see how um, uh, uh, gutting net neutrality is is going to stop monopolies, considering that they. Considering that right now are only access are most people's only access through said monopolies, uh, we are going to have to to even access another ISP. We're gonna have to go through set monopoly without net neutrality, which is which is actually like which is an obstacle in its own. The, the ISP can block uh, the competition, which is why net neutrality was created in the first place. I believe. So um, yeah, great question. Um, so when I say free market right? I automatically mean the absence of the state, right? Um, or like a market where the state has not infiltrated at all. Like let's say pretty much the electronics industry, you know? Um, 
So that's what I mean when I say free market. So when you say, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, if we, if we, um, you know, remove net neutrality and these, these companies have, you know, the power to do whatever they want in the free market. No, it's not a free market again, because they are, they still have their political connections. They still have their influence. They still are able to bribe and buy politicians, right? This is at, at essence why I, I not only am opposed to net neutrality, but why I, 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 um, advocate for volunteerism for, free markets, for anarchism, for individuals to empower themselves to live their lives as if the state does not exist, right? Because basically, let, 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 me, let me just describe again a different way um, about the state. You know, how many people um, are involved in the state? You know, let's say a couple of hundred politicians, you know, let's say, I don't know, a couple of thousand of senators, you know, House of Representatives, things like that. Um, so very small amount of people and then you have maybe like a million law enforcement officers that are basically the force and the violence behind the state's laws and regulations. Okay. So there's what 312 million people in the United States right now. Right now we say that this huge government is oppressing us, right? We don't want the government to get too huge because if it, do if it does, it's going to oppress us again. A couple of hundred politicians, a couple of thousand senators, representatives, maybe a million officers and soldiers too, right? Now, is it possible for a million officers to oppress 312 million people? I don't think so. I don't think that's do. possible at all. Now, the only way, hold on, hold on. The only way that that's possible is if the people believe that the state is legitimate. If they don't believe that the state is an agency of violence, is an agency of force that only exists, um, that only exists through, you know, uh, yeah, again, through threats of coercion. That's the only reason. It, that's the that's the, that's the only arsenal it has, and the only way that it has all this power. You know, we say Obama has all this power, Trump has all this power. The only way that these politicians have all their power is because the vast majority of people believe they are legitimate rulers. Now, I live my life as if the state does not exist. Okay? Now, that, that's not to say... Now, listen, listen. That's not to say that I'm an immoral person. I have a moral compass. I have a conscience. I understand what morality is. That's all I talk about on my podcast is morality, economics, and philosophy. I teach that to my kids. Every person that I interact with, I teach them. That's what you should obey. You should obey your own moral compass, your own conscience, not a law, not a regulation, right? Murder is bad because you're violating the self-ownership of another person, not because it's illegal, right? It must, things must be universal, right? If, if theft is wrong for me, if I point a gun at somebody and rob them, that's theft, that's wrong, I go to jail. If, if, an, if, a, if a politician robs me via taxation, if I don't pay, I go to jail. It's called taxation and it's legitimate, right? So it's not, these concepts are not universal. When the state does a, you know, if an individual, yeah, next phone died. Mm. If, if uh, an individual does what, 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 um, you know, the state representatives or what the state, um, agents of the state do what, what the officers, what the, what the law enforcement officers do, they would be, they would be committing a crime and they would go to jail. Right. If you if you follow somebody in the road and you force them to pull over because they don't have a seatbelt on, yeah, but what if she you're, really you're, cute? you're assaulting them. <laughs> so so basically, this is what I'm talking about. This is why um, the way I look at it, the state the state has no power without the people actually believing they have power. Right. Oh. Because the people are so out outnumbering and outclassing and out um, <laughs> you know so much stronger. Than the state. The state is basically like a parasite. It's a parasite on the neck of the industrious, of the productive people, right? All the state does is siphon away productivity from those people that are actually producing the wealth and that are okay. doing the work. Yeah. So, so I, I think we get it that. You, you, so I think you, what you're trying to make clear is that the number one thing that we could do is abolish regulation. That's the absolute best solution. Um, but given that that's not happening overnight, is a good second best situation to maintain that neutrality? 
No, <laughs> because I, I would I would not support again. Well, okay. So you've so, already so, said so, that. So, so, hold on, hold on. So there are some anarchists that say, you know, if the politician says, um, "I'll tax you at fifty percent," and then another politician says, "I'll tax you at forty-five percent." Isn't it a good thing, even though we're anarchists, isn't it a good thing that we advocate for the politician that taxes us at 45%, right? They're stealing us, they're stealing from us less. And, I, and on the surface, it would, it would seem to say, yes, that's a good thing. But again, any, the way I look at it, any attention, any participation in the political process legitimizes the violence of the state. So let me, Please. let me get on this stuff. So, so I, if, if I am getting a better understanding, Danilo, then what you're saying is that it's not so much that you are for or against net neutrality, given that you yourself don't have the voting power for it. It's like, you're against the idea of bothering with getting involved in it because it's the activities of the state and that that's not, a role for you to play in, in getting involved in that. And maybe in the short term, there are some penalties that go along with us losing net neutrality. Maybe there are not. But if our fears are short-sighted about the near term of, oh, we'll lose innovation, like we'll lose internet access, we'll lose the ability to organize and have activism, like it's possible that those things in a short run would happen. But if we had a long-term goal towards organism, uh, anarchy, that in the long term, humans would innovate and be uh, human ingenuity would overcome those issues in the long term. And yes, we might be upset and we might cry and we might be frustrated that we can't organize for a little while and that we're frustrated that we can't connect online and come together. And it would suck. Maybe like, ah, this sucks. But if we actually had our eyes on the long term prize of reaching some sort of anarchistic society, humans would innovate and be overcoming those things in a in time, maybe there would be a hit that we take. In time, we will be moving towards a positive goal. Whereas if we waste our time pedaling our feet, going back and forth every two years about net neutrality and this issue and that issue, we're constantly being complicit in a system that will never be escaped from. It will only be kind of shifted around and moved back and forth. Whereas at least under your terms, there may be a short-term frustration. It doesn't mean that we're going to be like fire in the streets and burning down City Hall, but it's an appropriate long-term measure to take and so you're is that that's kind of yeah i think that's a fair that's a fair uh, uh synopsis so uh i guess i would have to uh, i think i found some i think i um i do uh i mean i i've i've done some research on anarchy and i think it's a uh, quite fascinating and uh, definitely has some very very valid arguments and um, i think it's quite interesting uh however uh i guess i guess my only uh i guess my only the reason um Obviously, the reason I'm sitting here is because I am participating in the state. In fact, Brian, uh, Brian, uh, the staff member at my school, Jim, uh, you met him, of course, and um, he he uh, actually doesn't vote for the same reason that he's you an don't want. Um, yeah, he uh, he doesn't want the uh, government to. Uh, he's an anarchist, I believe. Uh, he doesn't want the government to get involved in uh, any of this. And uh, I suppose I definitely do understand the point of view, but from but from where I'm sitting. And from what I see happening, I guess I see the pro I weigh the pros and cons in my head, and I see how much. Yeah, here's how much it'll take to get to anarchy. Here's what it will offer. Here's how much we are here. What can we do realistically? What's realistically going to help that? What realistically is going to be opposed to that? And what realistically can we do now to improve uh, the best method of communication uh, that we have and the best method of organization uh, that we have? But I, I think that actually we only have around I think three minutes left. So, uh, of this podcast, and it's been a really cool ride. So, um, uh, our, does our new guest, uh, do, do you want to say anything or bring any topics up? <laughs> I don't mind going over a little bit. We have us three minutes of gold now. Yeah, we, no, we, we started about 20 minutes late, right? We were going to do a 12 hour run, and I think we started like 20 minutes late. So, if we go over a little bit, like, I don't mind. Do yeah, we can go over a little bit. <laughs> Wait, uh, were you talking about me being here two hours ago? No, 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 no. no. I mean, in the no, morning. We were, this we were morning, we were originally going to start. Jim and I had technical difficulty. Jim and I started the stream. Uh, Jim and I started the stream 11 hours and 28 minutes ago. Ooh, yeah, uh, so we started storm. a half hour late. Yeah, actually, let me speak in which. Let me run uh, and use the bathroom real quick. Sorry to leave as veronica's about to no i can hold it for i can hold it for longer. No, i'm not gonna be a dick no, she comes was, in how do you identify your 
It's like, oh, Veronica, identify yourself. She's like, oh, I work for Jim. And I'm like, okay. Like, there's more to you than the fact that you do some okay. development. Work. Okay. And then she goes to more to stuff further. Than... Say, oh, I don't have a bathroom. <laughs> no, um... I can, I'll hold it a little longer. I've only, peed, <laughs> I've only peed once during this entire thing. Wow. Wow. That's a. You guys, that's an accomplishment. That's a long time. You guys are dedicated. <laughs> so have I, actually. I mean, I've been doing breaks because I have to go to other places, but I think that I have as well. Bell out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm a person of a few words. I, I just uh, think that I, I really don't want any websites to go real slow. I, I don't want... Um, I'm going to the protest in um, Palo Alto. I'm in California. Like Palo Alto isn't that big of a city, or is it? I don't know. And, and in the Verizon protest thing, I don't know. I've never been to a protest. I think it would be fun. Uh, um, and I just don't like wait but there's like these two things so verizon's like really big and then the government is even bigger so there's these really two big things that are controlling the internet and so verizon is con controlling the, s the small websites or whatever I, I tried to look this stuff up beforehand but just scrolling through a wikipedia page um, <laughs> and um and then so the government is trying to restrict the big companies like Verizon from doing that. And um, it's, it's just, I just wish that they both would stop, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's Danilo's philosophy now. Can, can I, can I, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the economics of the whole idea of, you know, controlling the internet and uh, like apart from the government right what yeah. is the economics behind the, that like what, what does that mean to control the internet right um and yeah. and i wanted to i think that would clear up a lot a lot of confusion because it, it seems to be a complex topic but i don't think it needs to be right so you know a lot of people um ascribe the internet to be something special and it is special but and, and and vital and important, you know, access to all this information, and great stuff. Um, however, you know, we need a lot of other things. We need food. We need water. You know, we need education. We need friends. And and to say that something is more important than something else um, is to me an inaccuracy, right? So just like you know, we have farmers. We have, you know, people making cars, we have people fixing cars, people making houses. These are all services, right, that people provide for a price, right? And you can pay a small price and get a lower quality service, or you can pay a higher price and get a higher quality service. Now, the same thing with these companies. Now, I understand that they have enormous um, government influence throughout the decades, even before the internet. Um, and that they have laid the foundation for broadband and, and for transmission of this data. And so it's kind of very difficult to divorce these companies from the state. But, you know, just, just think about this, that, that all they are providing is a service, just like a farmer, just like somebody who builds houses, just like somebody who makes cars. All they're providing is a service. They are bringing information to you, right? And... And what I'm saying is that is no different, right? And what essentially what the price mechanism does, um, which is a beautiful thing, is it provides feedback from consumer to producer, right? It, 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 um, it tells the producer what the consumer wants, what they're willing to pay for, what they're willing to buy, right? And it gives feedback to the producer and telling them what they should produce, what they should focus on, what they should focus their resources on making available, right? And the very same thing. So, so you know, when you go on a plane, you know, there's the economy class and then there's first class, right? Much big difference in price, big difference in quality and comfort and service and so many things, right? <laughs> now, people take first class because it's valuable to them because they want to. Right. And for, to me, the very same reason, you know, if, if we imagine that 
there will be um, fast lanes and there will be slow lanes, even let's say on a highway, right? Again, it's difficult to, to draw an analogy because <laughs> roads are government controlled. <laughs> but if we imagine, um, you know, information tra traveling along um, a network, it, it's, not, it's not an infinite resource. It's a scarce resource, right? We cannot all do the very same thing on the internet. What's up, uh, you know, you. We cannot all go to the very same... Uh, wait, hold on, hold on. Let me just finish. We cannot all go to the very same website. It will probably crash. We cannot all watch the very same video on, on YouTube. It will probably crash, right? So there is a certain amount of data, of information that's able to be transmitted. Now, um, with net neutrality... If we were to say that no, no discrimination can be made, that all information is the same, that you know they can't charge different prices to different people, what we're essentially saying is that everybody will be slowed down. Everybody will be on the slow lane. Now, what I'm saying is that when companies are able to freely um, distribute their services, when companies are freely able to distribute their services, right, you will have a broad, a very broad spectrum of prices, right? Because the guy who who likes to watch cat videos in his basement has a different um, demand for data than the than the than the guy, you know, the, the the executive of a large company, or I don't know, people who like to watch high definition videos, right? They have different demands. And again, so why would it? Why would you not want to provide different price structures, just like any other service, just like buying a car? We buy different, um, different um, tiers of prices, just like boarding a plane, just like food. You know, you get poor quality food, you get expensive food, right? So when when companies are allowed to freely innovate and function as they should, what we get is is not only a a, um, a divergence and and a large spectrum of prices, but we get more competition, which leads to increased quality and decrease uh, price overall. Think about the electronics industry: increased quality and innovation, and a decrease in prices. So, I think I think the economics uh, of the situation is also helpful to to understand. So, I think that um, uh, if I could uh, respond, I think that um, what. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Oh crap! Uh, dang it! I had the. I had this joke. Veronica, I wanted to make. Veronica, now you, you messed something? it up. Oh, oh yeah. man! Tell the joke. Tell the joke. <laughs> okay, so you said something about the highway, right? So I wanted to add something to that. So your thought about the highway, right? Okay, so uh, all the websites are cars, and some are, you, you know, they they have a lot going on in their website, and so they're in the slow lane, and then there's some that are very simple websites. They're in the hot and on the in the right. Uh, wait. In the left lane, <laughs> and, and then uh, the fast lane, and then so what you're saying is that uh, people like Verizon, well, cars like Verizon, can go in the uh, in the left lane and go really slow in the left lane, so that the fast websites can cars can they have to slow down because there's this really there's this car there's this obstacle and they and they can't go past them because there are other cars next to them and creates a traffic jam. <laughs> Wait, was that a question or an observation? <laughs> it was an observation. There's like this piece here. So like, okay. Tim, if, before you, uh, yeah. I, I, I actually have to get going, but okay. uh, I, I thank you guys. I learned a lot about uh, something that I wasn't very familiar with before. Cool, man. And, Thanks for joining in, Nick. It was awesome having you on, dude. Yeah, thank you very much. And it was a pleasure meeting all you guys. You let me know hey, that time, uh, you're doing it. I'll, I'll, I'll commit a few more hours. <laughs> all right. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you. It was nice meeting you. All right. Nice Thanks. Meeting. Bye, Nick. I mean, there's a certain sentiment that you're getting at that is that if, um, let's say it's the internet, that if all of a sudden the internet gets fucked up, Okay. And all the people that you know have been talking about, like whether you're an activist or a small business owner, uh, whatever your interest in using the internet at and kind of an equal level playing field, if those opportunities disappear, so like if people like Nick who was on here earlier aren't able to use the internet for for organizing and activism, and like the online communities that I've mentioned earlier, whether it's the Unschooling Network or whether it's the New Light Beings one, that if these things were to be taken away because the powers that be wanted them to not exist anymore, 
And in many ways, they would, whether you're a pharma company, not wanting a bunch of people to be getting together discussing alternative mental health, or whether you're the school system, not wanting a bunch of people doing unschooling. There are some powerful entities that would not want these people organizing in the way that they've had, right? So if, if it is true that net neutrality was uh, removed or becomes removed, and if it is true that the powers that be silence these voices and these different methods, we're sitting here saying, oh no, fuck, what are we going to do? They're going to destroy the internet. They're going to ruin it. It's going to change everything. And what you're saying is, yes, that's possible, but it is in human nature and it is the way that humans are. We're creative. We're innovative. If there is a problem, we will come up with solutions to invent around this problem. So if it's true, like we haven't been presented yet with the world where the internet is totally fucked. But if it was, then you'd have a bunch of nerds and engineers. Like you'd have people like me and Veronica and Adam, because Adam's an engineer too. You'd have us being like, okay, we got this problem. What can we do to come up with a solution? And all these nerds in the world have been putting our brain power together to try to solve that problem. And right now, we're not really doing that because we're not forced to. Right now, we don't all have to bring our brain power together to come solve this problem. But if the internet did get fucked, then we would have to come and solve this problem and we'd all come together. And I guess like on behalf of all the nerds, it's like, it's like, I don't want to, I don't know. I don't want to have to like go reinvent the fucking internet, you know, just because some other people <laughs> fucked it up. You know, I, I guess like that's kind of like, I get it that we'd figure out another way. We'd find some kind of peer to peer system where instead of using the main lines, now that everyone's got Wi-Fi devices, we'd find ways to reprogram our Wi-Fi receptors. There's our hollow chain is coming out, like doing some kind of peer to peer network. So we don't rely on ISP. So like maybe it is possible that there are people already innovating in this way to avoid the need for ISPs. That there is a way that I've seen people talking about with hollow chain and some other technologies of like the point where you may not end up needing them and that it, maybe it is already happening that we're evolving away from it. And we're like treating a doomsday scenario because we don't have the new invention yet to replace the traditional internet. So, I mean, I, mean, I, I guess it is possible that that's, that's true. Uh, you know, it's frustrating maybe for the engineers of the world to be like, fuck, will you guys just like use the shit that we've got properly so we don't have to keep coming up with a new cool technology. It's like light bulbs. You know, I was in the LED lighting space. You come out with these like whoop de doo new LEDs, you put them in, they're supposed to reduce energy consumption, you know, 80% on your lighting bill and like save everyone energy and you plug them in and then you get a customer who you just relit his building with energy saving devices. And then they go, oh, I love it. Like you relit my building, it's great. And now I just leave the lights on all the time. And you're like, what? And you're like, well, my energy bill went down a bunch. So I just leave the lights on all the time. And you're like, you cocksucker. Like, dude, there were people that spent a lot of time doing scientific research, figuring out how an LED even works and how it could produce light. And then there's engineers figuring out, like, how can we take this scientific discovery and figure out how we can make a device that's going to emit light, focus it, and then build a packaging and, and, and you know, and, and a proper device that actually built, fits into a house. And then you've got some laborers in China, which part of the reason for the drive down in costs and electronics is also a lot of cheap labor that's putting this shit together overseas. We can't like deny that aspect of the free market. We have like all these laborers in China putting these light bulbs together and boom. Then you put it on a ship, you ship it over the Pacific to the United States. And then all of a sudden, like the United States Postal Service, which we talked about how much they suck, they're selling and moving these products all around the country and people install them. And all these people think that they're like saving the world and reducing energy consumption. And then the public are just like, oh, great. I'll just leave the light on all the time. And they're like, fuck it. And so like, sometimes I think like maybe like the engineers of the world are like maybe tired of having to like solve all the fucking problems that the public are creating in some way. And that other people like, I don't know. I mean, maybe like there's like a little bit of like... Um, a, a revolt of like we got something that works and other people are fucking it up so now we gotta all come together and uh, we gotta fix it i don't know so a little flavor uh, i kind of wanted kind of i wanted to respond to um uh, what danilo said about um well why not just um isn't it free to have people that are using different the internet for different services pay more or pay less and I, 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 I agree, but not in the way where revoking net neutrality and having you pick and choose what websites you want, because again, that can restrict uh, third party uh, websites. So what I think what would work is, Jim and I were talking about this a lot earlier on the stream, well not a lot, maybe two hours ago or so, I don't remember, but uh, we were talking about how, we were actually reading an uh, anti-net neutrality article, and we, uh, and we were thinking about, well, why wouldn't you just pay for the amount of bandwidth that you're using? Uh, rather than which you do, uh, rather than, you know, the uh, specific websites you're going to. So, and because that would work in a lot more fair way. 
So for example, uh, instead of having to, uh, instead of having to, okay, you get the Netflix package, you get, you get the TV package, you get Netflix, you get Hulu, you get da, 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 da. You could actually, uh, so for example, if someone watched Netflix, if, if person A watched Netflix this much, or person B watched Netflix this much, they would pay different amounts other than they bought the Netflix package. Uh, now they have to pay uh, the same, the, a flat rate. They would pay based on how much um, they use the internet. And I think that's an even a more fair system. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, hmm. I, I mean, you know, the, the thing with, with net neutrality, the way I look at it is that um, it, even if it does go through, um, I don't think it will work. Meaning um, people, people love the internet because it's unregulated. Right? Wait, just to be clear, are you saying if the repeal goes through or if net neutrality? Oh, sorry, sorry. If net neutrality goes through, if it gets, if it gets, um, um, I don't know, implemented, net neutrality. So if, if net neutrality is maintained is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Maintained. Right. Okay. Right. If, if, or if it gets maintained, yeah, if it, if it clamps down, if they, if they increase regulations, if they force the ISPs to, you know, across the board, only, only give one, um, uh, you know, speed and one price and all that. Um, I, I honestly don't think it will succeed um, because I think and, and like, like, uh, uh, like Jim says, you know, if, if what if the internet, uh, gets messed up you know what are we going to do then and honestly i don't think it will i think the internet is so vast i think it is so distributed i think the reason that people love the internet is because it's unregulated right because you can you can make any website and not only on the regular internet but on the dark net <laughs> you can make yeah. any website right that that's why people love it right so if if all of a sudden the this the state would impose more restrictions, more regulations on what people can do online. Um, I think there will be a massive surge in, in, um, in, uh, you know, in programmers and people who are, who are tech savvy to try to find ways around it. That is, that is just human nature, human nature. The way I see it shuns control. Right. And that is essentially what the internet is trying to do. Uh, that's what the state is trying to do is control you know, and suppress because that when, when when the state regulates something, that's in essence equivalent to it controlling it, right? You know, just just shy of nationalizing it, all right? Right? Regulation and taxation is control, right? So, so I honestly don't think it would work because there are so many people that even if they don't call themselves anarchists, they are acting as anarchists because they people love. They love innovation. They love, you know, diversity in products, in a marketplace. You know, we, people love electronics because we have such a diverse uh, array of them. People, you know, people love, you know, computers because they're such a diverse and there's, you know, the innovation is happening every day. You can't even keep up with it. It's happening so fast. Right. And, and, and so that's why I think it's going to, even if it succeeds, it's going to fail. Okay, so I think I see what you're saying. You're saying that more regulation is bad by the government, right? If the government regulates the internet, that's going to be a decrease in the quality of the internet. Is that correct? Yeah, that's fair to say. So, but isn't a repeal of net neutrality opening the door to regulation by internet service providers? Because now uh -huh. they are free to choose what content they put out or what gets distributed. <clears throat> um, well, again... It's not. It's not just that I'm that I'm uh, opposed to net neutrality, but it's also that I'm an anarchist, <laughs> right? And right, so, right. to That's me, fair. I think we get that point. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think I think what you're talking about is you're talking about a, a pragmatic approach, right? Yes. So as long That's as we have, so. yeah, as long as we have the state, you know, as long as we have the companies as they are, let's use the state to our advantage. And basically, what I'm saying is, again, the state is a 900 pound gorilla. You can push it in a direction. After that, you have absolutely no control. You have no control. You know, you can, you can um, whip the people up and get them in nationalistic fervor to go invade a country. And then after they invade, you have absolutely no control of what they do there. Absolutely no control. You can elect a politician. He gets into office. That, again, and then like you have absolutely no control what he does after that. For four years, Probably maybe last. you can kick We're him out in four that. more years. You have absolutely no control of what he does yeah. in I'll, office. I'll be off real quick. So that's what I'm saying is that we can't control what the state does. Again, it's a 900 pound gorilla. We have no control over what it does. And most of the time it's a, it's a bull in a China shop, just wreaking havoc and destruction. <laughs> and I think I, I think I just want to, um, 
uh, really quick. And I, I do, uh, I think I, do, I definitely do agree with your point there about how people are smart programmers. They can find ways, they can, if they work hard enough, if people get together, we can work ways around this. But the thing is, I guess my point really is they shouldn't have to. <laughs> uh, I don't really think they should have to do this. I think that uh, they should, you know, be able to access it uh, as it is now. And I just wanted to uh, really quick uh, make a statement about um, uh, the stream, uh, no matter what everyone's viewpoint is. Uh, I just want to say that, I mean, I just want to say uh, we've done an incredible job. Uh, in around 11 minutes, we will have reached the 12 hour mark. Can and we go around and do closing remarks then? So we'll yeah, finish, let's do we'll, that. we'll hit at that close mark then. All right, so who wants to begin? Not it. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it. Everyone wants the last. Everyone wants the last word, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, what what is the the basic essence of what we've talked about here? <laughs> that um, that net neutrality. Uh, that a lot of people think that net neutrality is a good thing, but then also we don't real we, we feel like oh if if the government controls uh who can do what with the internet then it's it's bad and oh the uh, the people will use the internet less anyway maybe if if the the big people control it and so they'll stop controlling it because they'll see that it's that's bad to control <laughs> i don't know okay cool Dinella. So I just want to thank you for inviting me on this uh, live stream. This was a last minute thing, but I'm really glad uh, to have taken part in it. Um, and uh, yeah, so so I think, you know, this is one of many topics that um, needs to be talked about, you know, and, uh, and discussions like this are absolutely essential and wonderful because if we if we don't have educated and intellectual discussions with words, what we do have is violence <laughs> with sticks and stones and bats. And you want to first begin with the words and talk to people and try to persuade them with your arguments and with your logic. Right. So and that's we'll go from there. <laughs> and go from there. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the thing. So, so yeah, again, I mean, neutrality to me is the, is the, is the, you know, first thing in, in a larger problem of what I call statism or the belief in authority or the belief in the state, um, and, and I don't believe as a principled anarchist and volunteers that anything the state does can yield a beneficial or positive outcome. Um, and, and there's this idea of, you know, like, like Jim was saying before, um, you know, there's a problem in the world. But I don't like the government, but we need the government to solve this problem. <laughs> so you're like, you're going back and forth. But, but there's this idea of, of legislating morality. Right. And and that's what a lot of politicians try to do. You know, they say, you know, drugs are bad. So we should pass a law to force everyone to to not do drugs. And what ends up happening? More people die from the law enforcers who are enforcing these laws than they actually die from the drugs. Right. So this is why this is why I'm saying that there is, in, in my mind, no positive outcome that can come from a state action regardless of what it is, net neutrality being the least among those. I'm sure a lot of people, a lot more people have suffered under the, the war on drugs than have suffered from, you know, regulatory uh, imposition by the state on these ISPs, you know, with slow loading of your YouTube videos, you know, watching, I don't know, beautiful podcasts. So, <laughs> so th th this is what I'm saying. I, I prioritize certain things, but, but yeah, so, so that's why I'm saying um, my stance is, uh, Firmly principled anarchist volunteerist um, opposing anything the state does. <laughs> Adam, you want to do a closing remark? Yeah. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Danilo for joining us because it was definitely we needed someone to give the opposite point yes, of view. Yes, yes. I'm very glad about that. Yeah, I, I totally respect where you're yeah. coming from. I apologize that it's kind of a five or six on one. It's from no, point. it's all right. <laughs> I respect that a lot. Um, this may open up a huge can of worms. I know we're just fishing, so I apologize, but I think I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum as Danilo. Um, although that, you know, the state has its faults, I believe it's the, you have to pay to live in a society. I believe that's the government, you know, it creates the conditions that, are, that make it possible for a free market to exist. Um, it sets, it decides what is considered property. It wasn't so long ago that we considered people could be property. 
Uh, can a person control intellectual property? Can I control a video I create or, you know, Apple's rounded phones? Who protects their trademarks so that they don't get completely copied? Who decides if Monsanto can uh, copyright an organism? Secondly, decides what can be agreed upon in a contract. How can businesses do deal with each other if they don't, if they can't be sure that their contracts will be enforced? Uh, thirdly, do, do governments break up monopolies? How, to what extent do they allow monopolies to exist? Uh, four, bankruptcy prote uh, protections. What happens when someone can't pay their debts? What happens if they have to go bankrupt? And finally, fifth, you know, the enforcement of these rules. You know, in what way can they, can you give a teeth to, to enforce it? I understand that that can go horribly awry as we've seen, but I believe that there exists a balance uh, where both sides of the spectrum uh, can lead to big problems. Sure. All right. I'm next kind of caught in the clockwise road. So I really love having both Adam and, and Danilo's kind of perspective that, 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 that comes into this. And I thank everyone that throughout the day that was on this. So this is like, we're just about to 12. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.